Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Godrej Archives, I welcome you all to our sixth Thursday talk, uh, which we are hosting in collaboration with the Museum Society and the CSMUS. Uh, this Thursday talk is a bi-monthly online talk series started by Godrej Archives since September 2020, with an aim to keep the conversations going over the business histories and from exploring social lives of products like typewriter, chair, timber, to gaining insights into the pandemic and its impact on business in a historical context. Of course, we kept exploring different yet interesting facets of the corporate past of India. And this one is the sixth Thursday talk in the series. And it would take us through a trajectory of Indian advertising and the creative revolution that was witnessed in 1960s. Uh, for archivists, uh, advertisement play an important role in understanding the history of consumption and choices that society makes. Uh, advertisements, for example, in our collection at the Godrej Archives offer much more to a historian than merely advertising a product, as they are the reflections of the values that the company believes in and sociocultural as well as economic patterns of the society within which it operates. Uh, so when one really look at the advertisements in our collection, it really provides also uh, insights into how advertising has evolved over a period in India. Uh, for example, in the early 1900s, we have seen advertisements uh, were strictly mostly the textual messages. Later on, they carried illustrations using line drawings and sketches. From 1950s, we saw there is already an in-house publicity department in Godrej, uh, which was coming up with a lot of iconic taglines for Godrej products. Uh, but 1960s actually witnessed emergence of Indian you know, advertising agencies. And around the same time, we also see Godrej approaching advertising agency like Ulka for launching our new improved model of Godrej typewriter, which was M12 around 1965. And television later, of course, in 1980s added to the dynamics. And another iconic ad uh, that, you know, by Godrej that hit the television was for Godrej Storwell. You know, it opened with a wedding ceremony and many of you, you know, from the 80s might uh, actually remember this which had a really catchy jingle, which started with a wedding ceremony, you know, and the jingle was Sajan Ki Angan Mein Pahela Kadam, and it really won the hearts of the consumer. So advertising actually really plays an important role and it has come a long way, uh, you know, and uh, its role in building a brand is really, uh, you know, you cannot really deny. So yes, we are, you know, today we are really eager to listen to Dr. William Mazzarella to talk about the ad men and women who were actually behind these iconic ads and who made waves in 1960s and redefined advertising in India for us. Uh, so before that, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Firoza Godrej, Chairperson, Godrej Archives Council, uh, and the Museum Society of Mumbai uh, to address the gathering and also introduce the speaker. Over to you, Dr. Firoza Godrej. Jason? Ma'am, you're on and uh, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. So welcome everyone on behalf of, of course, the Godridge Archives. And Rinda, thank you very much for your introduction and slight background on the role that Godridge, small role that Godridge played in the 60s, 70s, when advertising was so nascent in our country. And uh, I'm glad you mentioned Olka. Uh, and I'll just mention the name is a little later. But uh, on behalf of the chairperson and trustees of the Museum Society of the, of the CSMVS uh, Museum in Bombay and the Museum Society, my colleagues on the Museum Society are members and guests who are attending today. On behalf of all of us, uh, Dr. William. Mazzarella, we are very, very honored that you have agreed to give us this talk this evening on a topic that I know is close to your heart. And I know there's going to, it's going to carry a lot of nostalgia from some of us who were just emerging from university in the 60s and 70s. And one of the most popular and uh, interesting careers to take was advertising. And those of us who did English literature had an added advantage. And those of us who went to commercial arts school also had a great advantage because we had jobs waiting for us then. So very apt topic 
the role of advertising has really evolved. The mediums have evolved. So we are very delighted, Dr. William, that you could give us this talk here today. A little background on what we are going to hear from Dr. William this evening. He'll be examining, as I said, the Indian, a generation of Indian advertising professionals who emerged in the 1960s, broke away from the big multinational agencies to start their own operations. And Rinda mentioned Ulka. And William, I'm really delighted when I look to the people joining, I can say young Maya Katrak is with us. She was a twinkle in her parents' eyes when they started the advertising agency. So I'm really happy. And I'm also happy to see Pervin and Sean Mahoney, who are pioneers in this field in the 60s, 70s, until they decided that they'd had enough and wanted a better quality of life. So amongst others, thank you so much for joining us. So it was these young men and women who made waves in the 1960s, both in relation to the broader context of the Indian business world during these years, and in relation to the subsequent developments that we have come to know and acknowledge, and I quote the word liberalization. So we are looking forward to this part of our history, an important part of business history that we are going to, you're going to share with us. And a few words about our scholarly speaker for today. He holds a prestigious chair at the University of Chicago, the Newcomb Family Professor of Anthropology. And he's taught at university, this university since 2001. He works on the political anthropology of mass publicity, critical theory, affect and aesthetics, psychoanalysis, ritual and performance. And I'm quite intrigued, the occult shadow of the modern. He has several publications to his credit and numerous papers, peer reviewed in journals. But I'd just like to mention a few which are quite apt for this evening's talk. Shoveling Smoke, Advertising and Globalization in Contemporary India, which came out in 2003. Sensorium, Cinema and the Open Edge of Mass Publicity in 2013, of Mass Society in 2017. He is the co-author with Eric Santa and Aaron Schuster of Sovereignty Incorporated, Three Inquiries in Politics and Enjoyment, which came up in 2020. So that was really in the middle of the pandemic. He's the co-editor with Raminda Kaur, on censorship in South Asia, cultural regulation between sedition and seduction. What a lovely title. And that came out in 2009. And he's the editor of the K.D. Kathrak Collected Poems, which came out in 2016. William, we're really delighted. We're looking forward to this uh, evening. And I know that uh, you are amongst friends over here. And uh, you're really an endophile. So with these few words, I'd like to just tech, thank the technical team. We have with us Aishwarya, Mrinalini, and Yashraj, of course, as always, very ably steered through this new technology by Professor Jason Johns. So thank you, tech team. And now I hand myself, I hand <laughs> Dr. Mozzarella to all of you. Thank you very, very much. Sit back, relax, enjoy the evening, and put all your questions down in the chat box. Thank you so much. Thank you. A very generous and, and kind invitation. Um, I'm, I'm only sorry that I can't be there in, in Mumbai with you. Um, it's been too long since I've been back in the city. But even just this little interaction feels like I'm, I'm already back there. I also wanted to thank Vrunda uh, Patare and the Godrich Archives for giving me this prompt to pull together uh, pieces of a project that I've really been working on for many, many years, uh, but had not yet really had a chance to say something concerted about. Um, before I start, I also wanted to note that one of the um, one of the melancholy aspects of working on this project now 
is that so many of the people who spoke to me and who generously shared their thoughts and their time with me are no longer around. Um, and I just wanted to mention some names um, in that list. Um, Anwar Ali Khan, Sudarshan Tir, Subhas Goshal, Andy Halwe, Anil Kapoor, Kersi Katrak, Usha Katrak, Bal Mundkur, Kiran Nagarkar, Alec Padamsi, and Frank Simoas. And I, I wanted particularly to dedicate this evening's uh, talk to Gautam Rakshit um, for his kindness and his generosity uh, in helping me with this project when I really didn't know what it was many years ago. And I only actually discovered his passing uh, in the process of putting this talk together. So um, that was a bit of a blow and uh, this is dedicated to him. All right, let me uh, start sharing the screen. So you should be able to see the PowerPoint. There we go. Is that, is that okay? Can everyone see? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. Yes. All right, well, I'm just gonna begin. This is a tale of two stories. It's as if the two stories belong to different worlds or rather they tell of the same events, but in such different tones that it becomes hard to understand them as referring to the same events. The first story is heroic, thrilling, daring. It tells of the young Bombay ad people, mostly men, but one or two women as well, who during the 1960s broke away from the stifling corporate agencies they'd come up through to start their own independent operations. Not just independent, creative, brash, buccaneering. People like Bal Mundkur, Nargis Wadia, Nari Hira, Kersi Katrak, Sylvester de Kuna, Frank Simoas, and others. Bombay itself was changing at breakneck speed during these years, as captured in, Ra in Raj Tapar's memoirs. Oh, let me see here. Ah, here we go. So quick was the pace of change that you felt there was a master plan behind it with its own momentum, which nothing would ever be able to stop. Every inch of land was transforming the skyline with a grotesque violence as the straight, characterless structures came shooting out of the ground, bereft of the normal amenities like water and parking space. Land was reclaimed at considerable cost, while money passed hands from contractor and builder to politician in a frenzied urgency. A new culture, if you can call it that, was emerging, a culture of hard drinking and consumerism and advertising, dinner at midnight, of a growing corporate sector while the old props of culture had migrated either to the capital or to Pune or Ahmedabad. Now Raj Tapar, along with her husband Ramesh, was part of the leftist intelligentsia that had flourished immediately before the events that she's describing here. Much the same sense of cultural displacement had the novelist Mulkraj Anand complaining to the then very young poet Don Moraes at some cocktail party or other in the late 1950s. The real aristocracy in Bombay now are the film stars and the British advertising executives, and they're both, both mostly illiterate. It's frightening. The young ad people that broke out and started new agencies in the 1960s were, of course, Indian, not British. They were not the first Indians to run full-blown advertising agencies in the way we understand the term today. But the point is that they gloried in breaking away from old pieties, and they reveled in the big gesture. When Bal Munkur started Ulka, he splashed out on 8,000 square feet of office space in the Nirmal building at the newly reclaimed Nariman Point at the then outrageous rate of two rupees per square foot, twice what anyone else was paying, and twice as much space as he actually needed. At that time, there was no Air India building, no express towers, no Oberoi Hotel. Not quite flatlands, but from high up in the new offices, it might as well have been. When I interviewed him in the late 1990s, Frank Samoas remembered the British-led advertising world that incubated him and the rest of his generation at the turn of the 60s. It was actually, it was actually the top of the parabolic, uh, expat parabolic curve. They were here in vast numbers. Most of them were colonially biased in various ways. They were perfectly happy to allow competent Indians to do the work and live a fairly subvertic life. They had large houses, they had servants, they had club memberships. They had all the privileges. They also had an income structure at the agencies, which was about five to 600% higher than the Indians who were doing the work. And Sylvester de Kuna, for his part, recalled 
the petty status hierarchies at the established agencies. You were judged by the kind of tea you were served, whether you were, uh, whether you were served in a cup or in a cup with a tray or with a tray with pouring things, judgment, whether it had a napkin at the bottom of it. Did you share a cabin? Did you have a cabin? How large was your cabin? The big agencies were, one could say, unwitting Trojan horses packed with the shock troops of the future. Lintas around 1960 was home to Alec Padamsi, Sham Benegal, Jerson de Kuna, Kersi Katrak, and Nargis Wadia. Bal Munkur, Frank Samoas, and Narihira were all at Benson's. Sylvie de Kuna was at ASP. The break when it came was startling. The new advertising certainly wasn't shy. Mohammed Khan, who worked at Kersi Katrak's MCM during its brief glory years, and then went on to co-found Rediffusion, told me, what MCM did was they used huge ads. They were about four to six times as large as every ad that came out. It just sort of hit you in the middle of the forehead. It was like a sledgehammer, very dramatic. Just like Bal Munkur had bought office space that he didn't even really need, MCM would buy advertising space on the page, even if they didn't fill it all, just so that they could own it. Again, the big gesture. In the established system, agencies weren't supposed to steal clients from each other, but new outfits like MCM pitched aggressively and speculatively for clients. And whereas the old agencies would give their clients options, various versions of a campaign or various campaign ideas, the new generation staked its pride on not pandering to the client's whims. Samoa's again, we believed in creativity more than anything else, and we were very cocky in our belief and the success that brought us so far. And we broke no nonsense from our clients. We said, take it or leave it. This is what we think you need. This is why you come to us. If you want to buy it, buy it. If not, farewell. Or as Muhammad Khan put it vividly, you go to a doctor. Does he tell you, do you want cancer? Do you want a headache? Do you want pneumonia? Come on now, choose. I mean, what are we? Options for what? Who's the expert here? Who's the guy who should know? When you present options, that means you as an agency are not sure of what you want to do. You don't know yourself. That's a very sorry comment on the agency. The story of the creative revolution in Indian advertising isn't so much about historical accuracy or even necessarily about good advertising. It's not uncommon these days that people look back at many of the ads from the 1960s as being full of words but lacking a big idea. But the story is told perhaps most of all as a fable of spirit, of the glimpse of a different world and of the seductive promise that doing well in business could actually be a kind of unbridled fun for those who could handle the prospect of failing or being fired. Okay, so that's one version of the story of the 1960s breakout generation. Here's another. This too is a fable of spirit, but of a very different kind. Consider a conversation that I had with Piyush Pandey in 1998, by that time, a creative star at Ogilvy & Mather. Pandey, uh, Pandey came up through O&M at a time when it was still dominated by the people who had broken out in the 1960s, who now in their turn had become the establishment. Times had changed, the ground had moved beneath their feet. The coming of commercial television in India in the early 1980s had completely transformed the advertising scene. Advertising had become more about telling short and emotive visual stories than about coming up with witty and literate copy. Advertising moved closer to Bollywood, Fluency and creativity in Hindi had become decisive in a market that was now truly a mass market. From this standpoint, the rebels of old looked more than little out of touch. The days of the long-winded urbane copywriters with literary ambitions were numbered. All those ads for the Café Royale at the Oberoi Hotel that went on about how the waiter would look askance at you if you put ice in the wrong drink. In the new world, some of the old guard continued to flourish, notably Alec Padamsi, who was by that time in charge at Lintas and who had a strongly cinematic sensibility. But the likes of Kersi Katrak and Frank Samoas were seen as dinosaurs pretty much overnight. For Piyush Pandey, who found himself in the new landscape of the 1980s, it was a matter of respecting the values of the India in which he had grown up. I think the number one thing that I realized in retrospect, he reflected, is that I was taught a very strong sense of pride for the land and therefore exposed to a lot in my childhood, both at home, as well as what my family did for me to try and respect the environment, respect your surroundings. And I think if there's one strong character in the kind of advertising that we do here at O&M, it's, it's that respect for the audience and for people here. 
Television had, Bundy argued, made the old creative stars obsolete because essentially it had revealed the narrowness of their cultural foundations. And therefore, he continued, the old drinking club kind of advertising got exposed because you were talking to 10 people and those 10 people backslapped you and you backslapped them and you gave awards to each other and felt very good about it. Television had in Pandey's story turned advertising into a truly populist art. With the advent of television came the opportunity now to talk to millions of people and to talk to those millions of people, you had to talk the language of those people. I think that turned it around. Later, Pandey would reflect on two big hit campaigns for the mid 1980s, Chal Meri Luna and Hamara Bajaj, both for scooters. Both campaigns, he wrote, captured the spirit and the pulse of non-Metro India. There was no attempt to make the commercials glossy or cast the so-called aspirational people. They presented India and Indians with simplicity, honesty, and integrity. Advertising was coming of age. Notice how the terms of the story get set up here. On the one hand, the snobby elitism of drinking club advertising. On the other, the language of the people. Artifice versus authenticity. Condescension versus commitment. Pandey continued, I personally think that the vision of a large number of people in advertising is limited because there's a sense of arrogance to say, I know more. That Gujarati sitting in Ahmedabad is dumb. I have a vision which is influenced by the Western society. I have my own interpretation of aspiration, which is minuscule. Who the hell are you? You're one of some 5,000 people working in advertising and you're trying to talk to 900 million people. Where are you living? Now, I later found that Bundy's words here were pretty much literally the pitch of a Frank Samoa's house ad from 1978. Just take a look at this for a moment. It's basically exactly the same point, but now rendered as a kind of positive argument for advertising. 6,000 people govern 650 million. There has never been a greater need for professional communication. Notice how Bundy's story too is a story of decolonization. The 1960s generation broke away from an expat dominated business world and set up shop on their own terms. But from the standpoint of the 1980s and after, their identifications were still too Western and in that sense, too colonial. They may not have looked to England anymore, although many of them still went on pilgrimages there. Their heroes might have been the brash New Yorkers of the Madison Avenue creative revolution, George Lois, Bill, Bill Bernbach and others. But from a later standpoint, they remained ignorant of the real India, the India of small towns and villages, the India outside South Bombay. Once upon a time, Subroto Sengupta, head of the Kolkata-based Clarion Agency, satirized the Bombay ad crowd of the 1960s as the Churchgate set. By the time I first met Piyush Pandey in 1998, that was clearly an insult. Pandey didn't, min Pandey didn't mince his words, I walked into that industry, he recalled. Those were the heydays of the Alec Padamsis and the works. And it took a little while to try and do something different. It took a couple of years for them to take notice of what you were doing. It took a couple of years for them to give us an award for fairly grassroots kind of stuff. Bundy paused for a beat before adding with an uproarious laugh. And I'm gonna leave this next line unspoken. How should we think these two stories together? Is it just a question of generational transition? Is it a matter of the true Indian market gradually emerging such that earlier limited approaches inevitably give way to better, more inclusive later ones? That would certainly be the way that one would explain it if one were looking at it from the perspective of liberalization and everything that followed. But that would be problematic in its own way because it would mean accepting the ideological premises of liberalization as the true and inevitable path. It would mean accepting, for example, the premise that consumption is a natural form of citizenship, which is a premise that liberalization itself installed. By the same token, I don't wanna fall into the trap of simply reproducing the nostalgic narrative of the old days, a narrative shot through with longing for an older vanished city, Bombay rather than Mumbai, the romance of a heavy drinking city under prohibition, of speakeasies run by Goan aunties, of 350 rupees a month for a shared room in Kolaba, of 38 rupees for a good steak at the rendezvous restaurant on the top floor of the Taj Intercontinental, of young women in low-slung hipster saris 
and young men daring to don colored shirts for the first time, of afternoons spent leafing through imported magazines at the US Information Service and the British Council, or browsing the Strand bookstore, of hanging out at Volga, Alibaba, Bombelli's, the other room at the Ambassador, or the little hut at the Ritz. Business meetings over a liquid lunch with the advertising manager from the Times of India at the Harbour Bar to get your ad placed, and then still having to send someone to the Times press at midnight, armed with a bottle of hooch, to make sure that the guy who did the typesetting didn't bump your ad for someone else's at the last minute. It's all very charming, and I'm as susceptible as anyone, but it also seems extremely distant from everything that was playing out in those very same streets in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The whole tumult of India in transition, documented in news reports in starkest contrast to the ads placed right alongside. The late 60s and early 70s were a time of exceptional political turmoil in India, strikes and lockouts, devaluations, two wars with Pakistan, street clashes between competing unions, shortages, the trauma of the Maharashtra famine in 1972, which sent waves upon waves of desperation into the city. In short, all the turbulence that culminated in Indira Gandhi's declaration of emergency in 1975. During the 60s and the early 70s, Indian democracy was expanding and it was vernacularizing. To use the anthropologist Thomas Blum Hansen's phrase, it was plebeianizing. For the cultural establishment, it was a confusing, even frightening time. An ad person might find cushy shelter at the Bombay Gymkhana, the Willingdon Club, or wherever, but it was a tactical retreat and in some ways an anxious one. In the ad world of the 60s, big booming personalities and performative trappings compensated for deep insecur insecurity, uncertainty about their place and their standing in the India that was emerging around them. This wasn't just a question of language or a question of how to relate at a cultural level. It was also a very real sense of discomfort with, with and alienation from the rough and tumble mass democracy that was coming into its own in the streets during those years. As one contemporary recalled, it was an extremely cocooned world. I went to a few parties where they were at. It could have been in Manhattan with India where it was. It was just far apart, far away. I think there was an impotence with the world of Indian politics. There was a sense of not being able to handle it, not being able to manage it to handle someone from the ship Sina who take out the thugs and have your knees broken. They couldn't handle it. Then again, who can? Standing up to that kind of intimidation takes a particular kind of locally rooted credibility and public profile. But it all added up to the sense that advertising folk, while presuming to address the consuming public, understood little of the real world and even less of the real India. Of course, there were plenty of youngsters from fancy families who were radicalized during these years many of them coming from the same backgrounds that fed the advertising business. But as one man who joined the Bombay ad world in the early 1970s recalled, it was a time where the chasm that separated those who burned for Naxalite revolution from those who got their fashion kicks from the junior statesmen seemed uncrossable. So again, how can we navigate the two stories that I've outlined without either falling prey to the nostalgia of the earlier generation or the triumphalism of the later one? Historicism is an easy habit, that is to say, the tendency to view the past through the lens of the present, as if the past is only ever a preparation for, or an imperfect early version of the present we now inhabit. What I mean by the lens of the present is, in this context, the lens of liberalization. Most importantly, how liberalization equated consumerism and citizenship in a way that has become a kind of common sense today. Stories of coming to advertising in the 60s and early 70s hum with an atmosphere of excitement. It's as if a life and a world that was being lived in black and white suddenly warped into color. Muhammad Khan described the Indian 50s as a time of dismal austerity. It was another world. It was poor. It was very, very middle class. Everything was in short supply. Soap you couldn't get. Sugar you couldn't get. Baby food you couldn't get. Chocolate you couldn't get. Butter you couldn't find. It was like England after the war, I would imagine. Nothing was available. People were undernourished. Khan's point wasn't just that it was a time of scarcity. It was also that the scarcity was moralized into a kind of middle-class piety of self-denial. People were also saints, he continued. Money was a terrible thing. You wouldn't buy chocolate. 
If chocolate came to the house, it was for the kids. I might have some, but it would be wrong for me to buy chocolate for myself. So the excuse was that if I buy it for my kids, then I can have a bit of it. You know, it's all the guilt attached to that. It was a time when, as Khan put it with a chuckle, anything that's enjoyable or made you feel good was either illegal or it was immoral or it was fattening. It's a common place to claim that advertising works through seduction. But what's so striking in the stories I collected is the intense seduction that the advertising business itself exerted on many of the bright young things who stumbled upon it. Ashok Kurian, who later founded both Ambience Advertising and ZTV, was in the late 60s, just starting out. He remembered being dazzled by the crowd at Kersi Katrak's MCM. Let's be honest, he smiled. It was a wonderful way to live because they had the nicest parties in town. They had the wildest people in town. All the senior people in MCM had signing accounts or they were allowed entertainment at the Taj. And part of it was this belief that if you're in advertising, you must leave a bohemian life, you know, which didn't happen in too many circles in the city. It happened in the theater group and it happened in advertising. It was a world redolent of a certain literary and artistic cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism, and yet not too serious, not too earnest. In fact, play in the sense of the kind of improvisation that bordered on the gentle con was an important qualification for the job. Nare Hira, who later started and ran magazines like Stardust, Savvy, and Showtime, interviewed for a management training program at S.H. Benson's in 1960. The man on the other side of the desk was Wally Olings, himself later a global branding guru. There were a lot of tests, Hira rem reminisced, and one of them was, how would you advertise Philly Shave in Punjab? And I rattled off this and that, and Olin said, but most people over there are Sardarjis and they don't use a shaver. I said, but 52.6%, which was totally out of the hat, do use this, that, or the other. Anyway, I went off thinking I'd screwed up my chances of getting the job. But to my surprise, I got a call and Wally told me, if somebody can bullshit like you, you belong in advertising. Hira ended up as an executive trainee at Benson's at the same time as Frank Samoas was a copy trainee there. Advertising in the 1960s was a new and very different kind of workplace. Titu Aluwalia, who would go on to transform Indian polling and market research, described the shock of joining J. Walter Thompson in 1965. Keep in mind that he's describing one of the big corporates here, not a freewheeling startup operation. Somebody introduced me to a young manager who ran the office, and I was very taken by the fact that somebody in his 20s could be the manager of an office. I thought he was very unlike the people that inhabited my world. My father was an insurance guy, very straight and narrow and dull. Everybody did what was expected of them. And here was this ad agency, even then, 1965, with everybody in jeans, women with their legs on the table and smoking, asking for a glass of wine and that kind of thing. I thought this seems like the kind of place I'd like to work in rather than the civil service, which is what my father would have liked. Advertising was raffish, but it was also respectable enough as a career for any educated young woman from a reasonably liberal family. Or let's put it this way, the very same person who would tell me how exciting and racy the business looked to any young aspirant would also assure me that it was nothing like the film industry. One of my interlocutors had been telling me what a glamorous reputation advertising had in the early 60s when he made his way in the business and how, quote, everybody thought that you'd meet models, you'd do this, you'd do that, unquote. But then when I followed up by intimating that there might have been just a whiff of the disreputable about the business, he responded very firmly indeed, no, not at all, not at all, not at all, not at all. I mean, they think of the film business like that even now, but not advertising. Advertising was supposed to be, you were supposed to be cultured. You were supposed to have a good background, you know? We might conclude perhaps that part of the fascination of advertising in these years was precisely that it allowed an exciting expansion of what the very idea of being cultured could mean. To be sure, advertising didn't have the dependable prestige of some other career options, especially the privileged ones for which there, was already a, there were already set paths through the right schools, the Dune schools, St. Paul's and Darjeeling, and on into the right companies, Levers or Indian Tobacco, at that time still Imperial Tobacco. But advertising provided a haven for people who couldn't or didn't want to adapt to the nine to five, to the bowing and the scraping. A place where you could be creative and enjoy yourself without having to be a starving artist. With his usual flair, 
Alec Padamsi remembered the re realization that gradually dawned on their contemporaries as he and his friends from the theater discovered advertising in the 1950s. They said, hey, this is wonderful. You can make money being creative. Lovely, never thought of it. In the early 70s, the Indian magazine boom that kicked off with titles like India Today just a few years later hadn't yet happened. Nor had the explosion in Indian language newspapers really taken off, or the cable and regional TV channel boom that was to follow in the 80s and 90s. There was no television advertising to speak on. Bombay had perhaps 20,000 TV sets in total. Television and radio were state-run, Doordarshan and All India Radio, which remained resistant to advertising until the late 70s. There was, of course, local point of sale advertising all over India, but if you were doing Air India ads, you were, as Nargiswadia remembered, advertising, quote, only to the top 2%, if that, because they had the buying power, they read the papers, unquote. Andy Halvey described the marketing situation in the 70s. Advertising was not big business. Frankly, advertising was a luxury and an inessential. Let's take an example. You're making Lifebuoy, a lever soap. You're selling it in 350,000 outlets around the country, most of whom you can't reach because there is no mass media available. The mass medium at the time was actually the cinema theater. And because of the license Raj, capacities were constrained. You couldn't produce more anyway, so why bother? You were selling everything you could. Everything was in short supply. You didn't need advertising. It was the era of, as Halle put it, them, thems that's got the licenses, gets the licenses. Distribution itself could be a moneymaker for producers. Invariably, there was a shortage, Ashok Kuryan explained. So you give the product to a distributor who paid you a whole lot of cash just to get the product from you, and he sold it on the black market. So it was a distribution system. Meanwhile, the big producers in any given sector would meet up at the clubs and fix the coming year's sales numbers. All this meant that advertising, too, was often a pretty leisurely affair, especially if you were in one of the big corporate agencies. The cozy nexus that I just described started to come undone in the late 60s, but the agencies that had in-house clients, like Lintas, could still bump along without breaking much of a sweat. Andy Holloway remembered the atmosphere of Lintas, which he joined in 1977. We had this account supervisor, a charming guy, Holloway recalled. Around 12, he would come filtering a lot around like, okay, chaps, anything you want to discuss? And we'd say no, and he'd say, okay, off for lunch. And the next you saw him was at 3.30. With a huge client like Unilever, most of the creative parameters were set in advance. Nargis Wadia, who worked at Lintas before starting her own agency, Interpart, in 1963, recalled, it was so boring because everything, every strategy was there in the book, pre-decided. Rexona, fair, fair, fairest. Lux for film stars. Lifeboy for health under the shower. It was so boring. So I used to sneak off with my book and go to the ladies and spend half an hour, come back and go and sit down. There was nothing to do. I mean, we'd spend hours discussing, shall we put a scent bottle there? One often hears that the ad business was the first workplace where Indians of all religious backgrounds mixed, where men and women interacted freely, and where, in a few cases, women could become bosses. At the same time, we shouldn't downplay the fact that the agencies were hierarchically structured along class lines. In the agency pecking order, the junior artists were at the bottom, below the art directors. The copywriters were thought to a bit, be a bit fancier because they mixed with the account executives and could, if necessary, speak directly with top clients. The biggest differentiator was, of course, fluency in English and what in those days was called westernization. Access to that fluency and to those networks, if one was not already part of the elite, required an expensive education at one of a handful of top schools. St. Stephen's in Delhi, Campion and Cathedral in Bombay, or Walsingham, St. Mary's and Mother Teresa's. Certainly not everyone who went on to make a significant mark in this English medium advertising world came from an elite background or from a family context in which English was cultivated, but the ones who came from outside felt it. Kiran Nagarkar, later a prominent novelist in both Marathi and in English, remarked that the literary and theatrical Padamsis and Akunas were not his world at all. The poet and artist Arun Kolatkar, who worked closely with Nagarkar at MCM and after, grew up even more remote from such Anglophone identifications and was able to turn his refusal of advertising blitz into a kind of gruff charisma. Kiran Kalap was at Lintas under Alec Padamsi and later started his own brand consultancy, Chlorophyll. 
He painted a touching picture of landing up in the Bombay ad world as an outsider from Chambur in the early 1980s. This was a world in which the cultural currency was theater and literature. Just imagine me, he said. I'm this suburban guy with coconut oil in my hair and shiny trousers. I had no clue about, I had never come to South Bombay. Inevitably, the clubbiness of the advertising business in those days was going to raise hackles, especially given that as Frank Samoas archly remembered, we all had Olympian egos. We all thought we were better than each other. In 1970, the journalist Bachi Kanga, who would later become Bachi Karkaria, penned a merciless satire on the advertising business for the Illustrated Weekly of India. An acquaintance in the trade warned me with air intellectual and accent fake. The advertising man is not to be confused with the salesman, old girl. You know, your common or garden boxweller. Kanga goes on to lampoon the ad person as a boxless boxweller, a kind of paper tiger conjuring much ado out, out of nothing, whose professional life is but a theatrical extension of the colonial mimicry of their cultural life. The cast of local plays, she goes on, reads like the list of Bombay's representatives at the 7th Asian Advertising Congress. Eight out of 10 ad men are actively involved in all culture vulture activities in the city. And it's always Western culture, absurd drama, which no one here really understands. Kanga's implication, of course, is that the ad men, for all their high cultural trappings, don't understand it either. In the end, Kanga wants us to believe they're just a ba bunch of blowhards. The first lesson in the profession is that though brevity may be the soul of witty copy, all conversation must be as pompously irrelevant as possible. Even many years later, people sometimes remembered the Bombay ad world of the 60s this way. What changed between Kanga's time of writing and Piyush Pandey's critique nearly 30 years later was that something that had been in a sense an irritating but ultimately trivial kind of cultural arrogance became with the coming of liberalization a much more serious infraction, even something approaching an ethical violation. And for this shift to happen, consumerism itself had to be given a populist democratic significance that it didn't have in the India of the 60s and 70s. Now we've already seen that Bombay advertising in the 50s and 60s overlapped significantly with the English language theater in the city. Alec Badamsi embodied that overlap more flamboyantly than anyone else. As he told me, because Gerson and myself, Sylvie, Kersi, and Orff were from this theater, we had a bigger persona and we had the ability to communicate. So in client meeting, when a theater man gets up and says, gentlemen, I'm going to tell you the secret of getting your product into each and every household, he has an ability to push it across with a sincerity and an earnestness and a vibrancy. 20 or 30 late years later, someone like Piyush Pandey was of course also a big charismatic personality. He too was all about walking into a room and taking it over. But whereas a Padamsi or a Katrak projected a theatrical, high cultural sort of gravitas, Pandey's charisma was all about the common touch. Years after our first meeting, Pandey satirized the high flown theatrical style of the old generation. You, the client, know the way I talk because in the evening I have a drink with you. And then we meet in the presentation and my voice becomes baritone and I'm a different animal. How can I be a different animal? Why can't I share a story with you like a human being? Nobody denies that whatever advertising generation you're talking about, the element of performance turns heads and sells campaigns. Every generation has its master magicians at the client meeting, but the magic spells of one generation don't work for the next. So it's telling that whereas many of the leading lights of the 60s generation were explicitly theatrical, the populism of the 80s generation was often expressed in terms of a carefully cultivated lack of artifice, as if advertising were finally simply presenting India as it really was. This is not to say that there wasn't still a concern with aspiration, with fantasy, and with living better lives through consumption. And I'm not saying for a moment that Pandey's style was not also theatrical, that it was not also performative. What I'm suggesting is that it's a different kind of theatricality one that is supposed to appear naturalistic, non-theatrical, and that this shift in performative styles went with a shift in the ideological profile of advertising in India, from the cosmopolitan stylings of the 60s to the populism of the 80s. At one level, one might be tempted to dismiss the church gate set phase of Indian advertising in the 60s as nothing more than post-colonial mimicry, slavish imitation of what was going on in the West, 
And certainly there were flagrant lifts, cases of straightforward plagiarism, just as there are many Bollywood movies today that are remakes of American films. At the same time, we might also consider the fact that in the 60s, there wasn't the kind of pressure to define oneself as Indian that took hold in the 90s, once liberalization and globalization kicked in, once a new kind of nationalism became a powerful force in Indian politics. As Gautam Rakshit of Advertising Avenues observed, when the foreign brands came back in after 91, a position opened up that was a challenge and perhaps also an anxiety, a position marked, this is India. Consider, for example, the ads that BPL made in the mid 90s, with Amitabh Bachchan asking, who are we as Indians? If anything, for the 1960s generation, the feeling was of the excitement of a global modernity of design, of fashion, of cultural reference points, a modernity that felt young and free in contrast to the hidebound norms that the British had bequeathed to the upper levels of the Indian business world, and certainly to the rather stiff English lit syllabi that was still taught in the top Indian colleges. As one woman remembered of what she called the English paradigm of those days, quote, there was something fuddy-duddy about stopping philosophy in the 19th century instead of moving on. All the syllabi in English, they stopped with 1857, Thomas Hardy, and you're done, unquote. And in fact, if you look at the advertising that the 1960s generation produced, it has the oddly hybrid feel of a very British public school plumminess reaching for the free jazz of American beatnik hipsterism. Mm -hmm. Something like, if I had to hazard a rough characterization, P.G. Woodhouse doing an impression of Allen Ginsberg. Advertising in the 1960s provided a cultural home for a generation that was, in a sense, marooned between an outmoded British canon and a series of indigenous reference points with which they didn't identify either. In that sense, this generation of ad people were perhaps the forerunners of what, in the 1990s, became the global publishing phenomenon of Indian writing in English. And of course, in many of those, in fact, many of those novelists had at one time or another been copywriters in ad, in ad agencies. If we wanted to get really grand, we might even say that this generation of ad folks mediated the transition between two world historical imperial projects, the 19th century British dominated civilizing project and the 20th century American dominated consumerist project. Now, scaling it down a few notches, I would say that the major difference between the Churchgate set and the Piyush Pande generation was not that one was out of touch with the real India and the other wasn't. Rather, it was that the historical context had shifted such that consumerism and the advertising that promotes it could now start to look like a form of participatory democracy. So when we criticize the Churchgate set for being elitist and out of touch, we should also acknowledge that they were working at a time when advertising was, to adapt a phrase from the novelist Amit Chaudhary, marginal to the larger and solemn task of nation building. Chaudhary isn't talking about advertising here. He's reflecting on the way that Indian poetry and fiction written in English has had to bear the stigma of inauthenticity, of not being socially or politically relevant. But we could easily say the same of the advertising generation of the 1960s marginal to the larger and solemn task of nation building. And that's what changed in the 1980s. At that point, advertising started to become precisely an idiom of nation building. It wasn't until the 80s and especially the 90s that Indian policymakers and Indian public culture started aligning with the global consumerist recipe that the United States had been pushing quite explicitly for much of the 20th century. And the advertising business was the most important herald of this global ideology. There is, of course, a kind of irony in this. What Ravinder Kaur has ironically called the brand new nation unleashed by liberalization, everything that we know as India shining, incredible India, make in India, and so on, all this was able to emerge onto the global stage, proudly confident in its Indian identity, by finally taking on board what until quite recently had been the Cold War consumerist project of US empire. Way back in 1937, the US head office of the J. Walter Thompson Agency put it quite directly in a booklet called A Primer of Capitalism Illustrated, and I quote, in all history, there has been nothing remotely like modern American business as a sensitive index to popular likes and dislikes. It is democracy plus. In the 1960s and 70s, this kind of thinking was still officially anathema in India. 
which meant that making advertising in India during that period was, at an ideological level, an entirely different proposition than it is now. One could say that it was a time in which advertising was quite literally politically incorrect. The first cohort of MBAs entered the advertising world in the mid 70s. Advertising became a profession in a way that it hadn't quite been before. Courtesy of the so-called signs of marketing, consumption began to look like the most sensitive index to popular needs and democratic dreams, democracy plus. I'm not trying to say that things were better in the 60s. I think it's true enough that the church gate set, if we want to call it that, did in many ways distance itself from the democratic struggles that were roiling India during these years. In some cases, this was, as I've suggested, an active choice. But this is not to say that the populist advertising style that followed the television revolution in the 80s was more politically responsive. Or rather, in a certain sense, it was more politically responsive in the sense that a weather vane responds to prevailing winds. It's often said that the policy of the Indian state from the 50s through the 70s was to contain the private sector. By the same token, the beginnings of liberalization in the 80s were part of a larger effort on the part of Mrs. Gandhi and the Congress party who had returned to power in 1980 to find a long-term solution to the political challenges that had mounted all through the 60s and 70s. All the ructions that V.S. Naipaul once called a million mutinies now. In that sense, mass consumerism in India was part of a larger strategy of political containment. Advertising responded to the opportunities of liberalization by becoming more demotic, which is perhaps not quite the same thing as more democratic. I don't want to reduce the Indian consumerist revolution to political reaction any more than I want to rom romanticize the 1960s. Rather, I'm suggesting that we call into question the just so story whereby advertising redeems its earlier elitism by becoming a true expression of the real India, democracy plus. Again, I wanna be clear about one thing here. I'm not interested in the usual boring argument about how consumerism is a deflection or a distraction from so-called real politics. I actually think that there's plenty of political significance going on in advertising, even if, even if it doesn't appear directly as politics, and even if the people who make it don't understand it that way. And certainly, if mass consumerism in India was part of a larger strategy of political containment, then it has also tended, one could say, to feed the very energies it was meant to control. A memory comes back to me. I'm putting my shoes on, getting ready to leave the flat of one of the great art directors of the 60s generation. We've spent the past couple of hours poring over and discussing the ads that his agency made all those years ago. Suddenly, he looks at me soberly and says, you know, most of those ads don't really seem so special to me now, after all. There's certainly sadness in his words, but there's also a sense that the magic is still real. It just isn't all or even mainly in the ads. For all that the 1960s generation is remembered for its creativity, and there were some real breakthroughs, I would argue that perhaps its most charismatic creation was itself, the dream space of the agency world. And I think that if there was something utopian about that dream space, then we have no right to dismiss it. One doesn't have to be a Freudian to see how the generational transition between the 60s and the 80s has strong Oedipal overtones. I don't just mean in the parasitical sense, although there was, as I have shown today, plenty of that. I mean, too, the disavowal that has to take place in order to grow up the putting away of childish things. When Piyush Pandey wrote about the 80s that advertising was coming of age, at one level it was just a conventional phrase, but when we look back now, if you'll permit me some Freudian language, it's as if the 60s generation does represent a kind of polymorphously perverse stage of Indian advertising, a time when every zone was erogenous and infantile narcissism was undisturbed. Again, from the standpoint of the present, the coming of the MBAs in the 70s and liberalization in the 80s and 90s represents the moment when the business has to grow up, to get serious, to become responsible with its money, and to organize and discipline its creative impulses by submitting them to the so-called science of marketing, to surrender its babbling to the big idea. After all, to, and above all, to take on the dull moral dignity of social utility. But we all know the cost of growing up, an intense ambivalence directed at the impermissible pleasures that have had to be rejected. 
an ambivalence that blends rage with nostalgic longing. And this perhaps helps to explain the simultaneous sense of aggressive rejection and soft-focused sentiment that clings to the memory of the 60s generation, a generation one could say that had to be killed in order to play its historical part politely. This was the price paid by many of the stars of that generation. In return for being written up in every retrospective article as the legends and the icons of the creative revolution, they had to accept a place in the brave new age of liberalization where they could only appear as it were in quotation marks, a citation of an earlier time, admired, but also at the same time a little derided for their outmoded avuncular grandiosity. But isn't this always the fate of the most beloved actors, entertainers, magicians, deceivers, truth tellers, either sacrifice or self-parody, and in the end it becomes hard to tell them apart. As the drama theorist Joseph Roach once observed, society has a self-defensive need to degrade the actor whose transformations it desires to witness. Thank you very much.